Hi everyone, it's Mr. Vallejo. Welcome to biology class. Today we'll be taking a look at the kingdom uh, Monera, it's the old name for it, but actually we're taking a look at, at all the bacteria. So we're looking at two kingdoms today. We're looking at eubacteria and the archaeobacteria, right? So let's go ahead and go to the PowerPoint for today. It looks like this. And then we're gonna take you to the actual slideshow. So let's go. Today we're looking at bacteria. All right. Um, so, um, you know, we, we haven't actually known about bacteria for, for that long. Um, the golden age of, back, of, of um, medical microbiology is generally considered to be about the uh, 1870s, 1880s, maybe the 1890s when things, uh, a lot of things were discovered. And, and so, um, and so the, the bacteria that we know a lot about uh, are the ones that, that affect us directly. So it says here, bacteria are unique and diverse with different roles. So here's just a list and I have a slide for each of these, but um, uh, the reason we, we know about bacteria is that some bacteria cause disease. Um, we know that uh, in the last, you know, uh, 20, 40 years, we know that bacteria can be used as, as biological weapons even, but there are, there, are, there are good reasons or there are beneficial bacteria and there are ways that bacteria help us instead of harm us. And so we need to look at those also. Some bacteria help recycle chemicals, some bacteria clean up the environment, and then prokaryotes are actually used in food production as well. So the bacteria that we know about are the ones that affect our lives every day. So, um, we need to know about the diversity of bacteria because bacteria, you know, um, does affect us. I mean, there are so many that don't have a direct effect on us, and so we don't we don't uh, study those um, as as uh, hardly as we do the other bacteria because these bacteria can kill us. Um, because these bacteria, uh, if we grow them right, we can they, we can uh, we can use them for good. So um, it's good for uh, scientists to know more about bacteria, uh, more about the diversity of bacteria, about their, their uniqueness and their uh, diversity, and the different things they can do. So um, here's, uh, here's some pictures of, of the uh, bacteria as a, uh, oh, you know, uh, uh, it says pathogenic bacteria cause disease by producing exotoxins. Uh, toxin is something that, that's uh, you know poisonous, and the exo is on the in, on the outside, and it says here producing exotoxins or endotoxins. So, um, so you have exo and so bacteria can be on the outside or they can be on the inside uh, when they're considered to be pathogenic bacteria. Bacteria can also be used as uh, biological weapons, anthrax is one that we we uh, we know about. And uh, several years ago, there were problems with people who were who were putting um, anthrax on even on letters, and then and then mailing them, and then they were having problems at post offices. So bacteria, such as the species that causes anthrax, can be used as biological weapons. Okay. Remember, you have access to all these slides in in uh, your learning management system, whether that's Canvas or Schoology. Prokaryotes help recycle chemicals and clean up the environment. Um, you know that, that, uh, that chemicals are recycled in ecological systems in biogeochemical um, cycles. And so um, when, when things die, they're broken down. And so we know that and we'll take a look at this group in a little bit, but the fungi, which includes the mushrooms and yeast, um, penicillin, these things are, uh, are decomposers. Uh, that is to say, they, uh, they, they break down um, things. And, and as they break them down, a big thing like this apple and the smaller pieces, um, when it's uh, so, so small, then the bacteria come in and break down those and, and make it into even microscopic pieces. 
Well, another thing that bacteria do, and, and the term prokaryote is the same as bacteria. And, and so ba all bacteria are prokaryotic and they're all prokaryotes and all prokaryotes are bacteria. So prokaryotes help recycle chemicals and clean up the environment. Um, there's a process called bioremediation. Bioremediation, we use the, these organisms to clean up pollution. That's what you see in this picture right here. In the, uh, in the oil spill in the 90s, uh, the Exxon Valdez uh, was a, a massive oil spill in Alaska. One of the things that they uh, were, were doing is using bacteria uh, to, to clean up the oil spill. They would use hot water and cold water and then um, oil degrading bacteria they were spraying and that's what's going on in this picture on the far right. Um, another thing that uh, bacteria do that are helpful for us is that, that we use bacteria in sewage treatment. Um, if you have a fish tank, an aquarium, you, you know, probably have some experience with this. You've got a filter in an aquarium and that filters uh, where the bacteria live. They also live on the rocks on the bottom. That's why people like to have rocks on the bottom of their aquarium. But, um, but in the filter, uh, you, you, uh, you have bacteria living and those bacteria are good bacteria. Uh, there's, uh, there's something called nitrobacter and uh, nitrosomonas, and these bacteria will, uh, will break down the uh, chemicals, uh, bad chemicals uh, in the water, um, like nitrites and nitrates, and they'll break them down and uh, using bacteria for good instead of evil. Uh, another thing that uh, we're thankful that bacteria do is, uh, is we use them in food production. The one that comes to mind are, are dairy products. Uh, and so if you, if you enjoy some yogurt sometime throughout the day, uh, bacteria used in the production of yogurt. Uh, there's a picture in the far left of the uh, lactobacillus uh, bacteria. These are also called the lactic uh, bacteria. And uh, they're also used in the production of sourdough bread, which is good stuff, and also in sauerkraut. So we know most about the bacteria that affect our lives every day. And so, um, so, uh, so that's why we study them. Let's go on. Um, let's see. This is the old school Kingdom Monera, that slide right here. And <clears throat> um, this, is, this is the way I learned it. Back in, in college, uh, we were still learning about the five kingdom classification scheme. Okay, it says here, all bacteria are in one kingdom. And that's right there, what we used to call Monera. We, that's an archaic term now, one we don't use. But you have um, all bacteria in one group in five different, uh, five different kingdoms. Now we'll study these later on in the semester, plants, animals, fungi, protista. Fungi and protista pretty quickly. Um, but bacteria are so different from each other that we actually now put them in two groups. So the two groups are down here, the eubacteria and the archibacteria. Um, these guys are so different that we actually put them, if, if, it's, if it's drawing were to scale, these guys would be so far off the computer to the right. Um, and so we, we say that they're in a different domain. They're in a different domain and, and uh, the, the, the domain is the arche and we'll see that in a little bit. But if you take a look at it, there's six kingdoms now, one, two, three, four that are the same. Uh, and then the Monera breaks up into the eubacteria and the archaea. Um, the, uh, the eubacteria and the archaea are, are both bacteria and it seems that, and it, it makes sense that we would talk about them together right now, but, uh, uh, but they again are so, so far different. And then I'll, I'll show you some examples of those in a little bit. Uh, bacteria and archaea are the two main branches that are prokaryotes. If you take a look at the taxonomic tree, you can see there's a branch here, the branch here, and then the other four are right there. Okay, the bacteria and, and the archaea are actually 
uh, distinguished on the basis of their nucleotide sequences. So I'm gonna show you on a table on the next slide that there are very subtle differences in the chemical, um, uh, the chemical structure of these bacteria. And, and that's, uh, you know, obviously we couldn't do that even 50 years ago and we lumped all the bacteria into one. But now we uh, have, have developed some processes where we can distinguish the differences between the bacteria and the archaea. Uh, the archaea are more simple and they, they generally, uh, they live in strange, um, unusual environments. <clears throat> you don't have to um, write all these down or, or know them, but I wanted to give you an idea of, of the differences between the bacteria and the archaea. The, where it says bacteria, that's the EU, U bacteria. Um, if you remember from previous talks, <clears throat> the prefix EU means good or true. So these are what we call the true bacteria and the archaea. That reminds you of a term like archaeology. And these are the really old bacteria, if you will. So these are just some differences uh, that we would see between bacteria and archaea. Okay. I want to remind you that bacteria and prokaryotes, those terms are used interchangeably. And I will still say uh, the term monera also. Uh, because uh, that is, uh, it, you know, it, it's only been a, a few years since we, well, you know, in my lifetime anyway, uh, there, there was a common term for, for the bacteria. Uh, let's see, so, so anytime you say bacteria, monerans, prokaryotes, it's all the same. So the bacteria and the monera are, interchangeable, those terms. All righty, let's go to the next slide. Uh, prokaryotes are different from eukaryotes. Uh, we've, when we study cell theory, like we did in the first semester, we were looking at eukaryotic cells, but there are structural and functional differences. Uh, and bacteria are unicellular. They are, are all made up of only one cell. Okay, there are some use, unicellular eukaryotic bacteria that we'll study called protista, but all bacteria are unicellular. There may be chains and clumps, but each one is an individual bacteria. They're much smaller than eukaryotes. Uh, we, as you know from your study of mitosis and meiosis, uh, we have chromosomes that, that when there's, sometimes they're jumbled up, sometimes they're uh, they're in a form that you can't see uh, because they're, they're not condensed, but, uh, but the bacteria have really small circular chromosomes. And then they also might have a small piece right there, a small piece of DNA called the plasmid, which we take advantage, in, uh, take advantage of in genetic engineering. These guys split by binary fission. By binary fission, binary means two and phys Fission means a split. So when these guys get big enough, the way they reproduce is they just keep eating and eating until they get big enough and they split in half. And another thing that you see in uh, prokaryotes is that they have no organelle. You remember the organelle are membrane bound uh, smaller uh, subcellular structures like mitochondria, like chloroplasts, all those little structures that have membranes uh, endoplasmic reticulum, a nucleus, um, prokaryotes, bacteria don't have any of these. They may have a simple flagella though. It's uh, made up of a uh, made up protein and uh, it uh, just turns around. It's like a propeller on a on a toy wooden plane. You ever have one of those wooden planes with the propeller and the rubber band attached to it? Uh, if you've ever had one of those, that's kind of how the flagella works and <clears throat> in the bacteria. Uh, eukaryotic cells that have flagella, as you might remember, is uh, are typically made up of, of uh, smaller, smaller threads. And those threads are, uh, you have two threads in the middle wrapped around by nine and it makes a really strong, strong cord. Like if you were to take a look at a piece of rope and it has all kinds of uh, little threads that make up the, the, uh, uh, the rope. That's what makes it so strong. Um, that's what our 
our uh, flagella look like, the eukaryotic flagella. But these are much more simple, just a solid protein. Uh, actually, a protein is called the uh, flagellin because it's a protein with an IN ending that uh, makes up the flagella. Eukaryotes are larger and more complex. And uh, eukaryotes, then, in, in comparison to bacteria, have organelle and those. They, they, instead of having that one circular chromosome that bacteria have, they have a bunch of chromosomes. Like we have uh, 46 chromosomes in 23 different pairs as humans. And, and you have many, many more genes. We have 25 to 30,000 different genes on, as, as part of our genome, but uh, bacteria, uh, much, much fewer. You know, some of them have just a thousand genes or so. All right, uh, between uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes are structural differences, but they're metabolic differences also. And those metabolic differences have to do just with the, the membrane, because as you know, uh, bacteria don't have organelle. So because they don't have organelle, they don't have all these little substructures that are inside of the cell that have different jobs. You remember in the eukaryotic cell, you have, uh, you have a, uh, the mitochondria that makes energy, um, it makes ATP uh, that is used for energy. Uh, you have chloroplasts, which go to uh, which, which is where photosynthesis takes place. You have the transmission of, of the secretory proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum. And so you have all these different structures that are membrane structures, membranous structures that uh, that have different jobs uh, in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes don't have that. They only have one membrane. So anything that's going to happen has to has to happen at that one membrane. That one membrane is called the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. Now, um, bacteria are actually very successful. I mean, they're everywhere. I mean, where you're sitting right now, uh, the uh, the table or surface that you have your computer on uh, or your paper. Uh, has bacteria on it, um, but the, those bacteria are not going to kill us, so it's not bad to have bacteria around. <clears throat> but uh, you know, as I, as I said in the very beginning, there's uh, reasons we know about some bacteria more than others because they have a direct effect on our lives. Well, why are bacteria so successful? And these four structures are structures that allow them <clears throat> to be uh, very successful. The cell wall protects the bacteria. Um, the pilus uh, is for reproduction. The flagella uh, helps the, the bacteria that do have the flagella to move. And then the spores or endospores are structures uh, that uh, help the bacteria to reproduce in, in really strange conditions. So it, it, uh, the, the spore, uh, will uh, allow these guys, the bacteria to live on. Even if that individual cell doesn't live on, then the spore makes it so that uh, uh, the, the group of bacteria, the species of bacteria, if you will, can move on as, as, a, as a whole group. So at the bottom I wrote, uh, what survival mechanisms do bacteria have as individual cells? Well, they have a cell wall, that's pretty good. And, as a population. Well, the population of bacteria continue because they're so good at reproducing because of these two things here, the pillars and the endospores. But I have slides for each of these. So let's take a look at these four slides here. You have the cell wall and the flagella, the pillars and the endospores. So um, let's take a look at those. Here's the cell wall. Now the cell wall is one of the most important features of nearly all prokaryotes, and you can see uh, in this picture, uh, in addition to this cell wall, some bacteria have uh, a capsule around that cell wall. Um, this is often sticky because of the chemical, the glycocalyx is another term for the capsule, but it allows the bacterium to stick on stuff and uh, also serves in a role in protection. Uh, so that's a, that's a capsule, but the cell wall itself is like this. If this is the bacterium, 
And here's a cutaway version of it. And that orange stuff right there, that's the cell membrane or plasma membrane. But on top of that, on the outside of that, this structure right here, it's blown up over here. This is the cell wall. Now the thing about the cell wall is the cell wall is made up of two different chemicals um, that are, are uh, the long chain going this way, but going back and forth, uh, this is called N-acetylglutamine. Uh, and uh, then you have these other ones uh, that uh, have little dots on them. This is N-acetylmuramic acid. And, and these two chemicals, you don't need to know the names of those two chemicals, but um, sometimes we call N-acetylmuramic acid NAM. And then the, the one that doesn't have any uh, speckles on it, um, those are NAG. Uh, uh, and the NAM and NAGs make a little cross linkage. So it's really strong. And that's what's happening right there. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, peptidoglycan is the chemical that's seen only in the bacteria cell wall. So we could take advantage of that characteristic uh, because uh, some, some drugs, what they'll do is they'll break the peptidoglycan side linkages right here. And that's how we kill some, some bad bacteria. Um, now, how do we know the bad bacteria from the good bacteria? Well, um, the cell wall is a part of that because we do something called the gram stain. And the gram stain, uh, this is a, a gram positive bacillus bacterium. And these, uh, these, are, these are cocci and they are gram negative. And you can see what it is, is the color difference. Um, these guys are able to, to uh, take, take up more of a dye called crystal violet uh, because they have much more of the peptidoglycan in the cell wall. And then these guys have, uh, have less peptidoglycan in the cell wall. So they hold less of the crystal violet color. And so they appear to be pink under the microscope. So that's how we tell the difference between, uh, between a uh, gram positive and a gram negative bacterium. And that's one of the first things we do when we classify. Another thing we do when we classify is we take a look at the different shapes and the different shapes of bacteria are the, the uh, spherical shape right here. And those are the cocci. And then we have the rod shaped bacteria, which are the bacilli and then the spirilli are right here. Sometimes these guys can be chains or links. You've probably heard of uh, uh, I've seen these bacteria, which are clumped up. So you have the uh, streptococcus bacteria. And so uh, a, a prefix can tell us something more about the structure of not the specific bacterium, but it, you know, a, a, a chain of bacteria or a clump of bacteria. Like, uh, like if you have a staph infection, uh, that is some bacteria that are clumped together. All right, um, some bacteria, and there are four structures we're going to take a look at. And those four structures have to do with the, how, or the success of bacteria, how well they do. So we have the cell wall, we have the flagellum, and then you can see the really long ones are we call flagella. The shorter ones are called uh, are cilia in, in eukaryotic cells, but here we call them uh, the uh, fimbria. And a lot of times your name depends on, on your, uh, uh, your job. And so, you know, my, my sister-in-law is, is, her name is Dr. Johnstone. Well, the doctor tells you what she does and what her job is. And so, um, so this right here is the, the pillus, but it's the same structure as the fimbria right here, but these fimbria are used to hold uh, the bacterium to a surface. And then flagella, different structure, but similar, but it's used for, for movement. So it's a flagella, uh, again, in bacteria, you can have more than one. Um, typically you might have one, but you can have several bacterium like in this, in this uh, photo right here. And they, again, are used for movement. Um, here's a picture of the flagellum and the cell wall. And you can see how they're stuck on there. It's got kind of has a rivet on the inside. But um, what happens is that if, if, at the very bottom, you can see 
it's kind of kinked up like that. But then because it is, when it rotates one way, it makes, uh, makes waves and then pushes the bacterium forward. And I mentioned this before, but the bacteria or uh, flagella is made up of a protein called flagellin. So that's the flagellin, the protein in flagella. Uh, here's the pilus and ephimbria. Again, the name depends on the job. And so uh, this is a, a photograph of the drawing that we saw on the previous slide, but you can see that there's many fimbria. But if, the, if that fimbrium is used for for reproduction, and we call the pilus. And you can see uh, these are the plural forms of these terms, uh, fimbria and pili. Uh, and then you have the fimbrium and the pilus. And then in the last structure I want to take a look at that helps these guys to uh, uh, survive, not possibly the individual bacterium, but as a population. Uh, endospores uh, will help these guys. To, uh, to continue the, the population. It's like an escape pod. It's like, a, you remember when Superman's planet was exploding, uh, his mom and dad were famous scientists and they stuck him in an escape pod and they, they kicked it off the planet. Well, even though the planet blew up, uh, Superman was able to survive. And so uh, it's like an escape pod is what an endospore is for bacteria. All right, a little bit quicker on some of these uh, 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 sections right here. This is section three on bacterial uh, variation. This is just a note that, that bacteria mutate very rapidly because their, their DNA is, is small and their DNA is uh, not protected. It's not in a nucleus. And so it happens more often than in eukaryotes that bacteria mutate. And I'll remind you from, uh, from our previous studies of of uh, DNA and biochemistry, that any change in the DNA is called a mutation. So um, things mutate all the time, but uh, very seldom do they do the mutation cause harm, and even more seldom does uh, mutation cause good. So um, you know things are mutating all the time, but it, it's more likely to get a bad mutation because the, the rate of mutation is so much greater in prokaryotes compared to eukaryotes. All right, another way that bacteria can become different besides mutating is that when we have that pilus that we saw earlier, what happens with the pilus is that a plasmid or in this picture it's called the fertility factor. It's on the right here. Uh, this can be transferred over to another bacterium. So if you have a gene on here that you want to share, uh, if, it's, if it's on there, then it can go uh, through the pilus and into the next bacterium. And then this guy uh, will have uh, a plasmid as well. Remember plasmid is a small piece of DNA. It might have a few genes on it, um, but now you've transferred that gene over. If that gene is something like, a, like some kind of disease or something, then, uh, then you've just transferred the, that disease from one bacterium to another. All right, um, the next section is on bacteria ecology and metabolic diversity. And, um, and so you can see that this is the organizing slide. I have slides for all of these. So this just shows you where we're going. But we'll take a look at some environments that bacteria are found in. And then here are some terms that you're going to want to know, um, obligate, facultative, uh, and the difference between those, and anaerobic and aerobic. Um, so uh, then we'll take a look at the autotrophic bacteria, which can make their, their own food. And most bacteria are heterotrophic. We'll, we'll see that in the slide. And then some, some bacteria are nitrogen-fixing bacteria and can get the nitrogen out of the air. Uh, and we're thankful they they do that because uh, the nitrogen is, is a part of the proteins and we can't do it. So let's go over and take a look at the slides for this section. The environment, it says it's ubiquitous and that means bacteria found everywhere. Now, um, you know, you expect them, like I mentioned earlier, they're on the table you're sitting at, um, and sitting, sitting behind, 
um, they're in your, uh, they're on your, your hands right now. Um, <clears throat> bacteria occur in almost every environment on earth, but even in places where we wouldn't anticipate it. Like right here, there's a picture of the uh, geothermal vents on the bottom of the ocean, hydrothermal vents. And, uh, and there's the scorching water coming out of there and going into the ocean water. Uh, but, the, but this area here is, is warm enough so that the bacteria can live and they take the energy from, uh, from chemicals that are around there that are coming out from, from the middle of the earth, uh, like I said, specifically hydrogen sulfide and it uses that hydrogen sulfide uh, as uh, energy source instead of eating food. That's pretty crazy. Those are called chemoautotrophic bacteria, but, um, but those bacteria are the basis for the whole food chain that is, uh, that is at the bottom of the ocean. That's, and if you take a look at this picture right here, you can see the, the staining on these rocks are because of bacteria that are living in the middle of these rocks. So that's pretty strange and unusual also that bacteria can live there, but they can live uh, just about anywhere. They live in the cooling jackets of nuclear reactors where well, you would think that'd be too hot, but it's not for some bacteria. Some bacteria are, are what we call thermophilic bacteria. They love heat. So we'll see that on the, on the next slide um, in, a, in a little bit. Um, bacteria have different oxygen requirements. Uh, those that live in the, in the open are called obligate anaerobic bacteria. Or actually, no, excuse me. Those, if they're living out in the environment, they're, they're obligate aerobic bacteria, which means that they're obligated to, uh, to breathe oxygen at the, at the percentage that it is in the atmosphere, which is 21%. Obligate anaerobic bacteria can't live in that. Uh, this, means, uh, this means without oxygen. So deep inside of a, of a garbage dump, there's bacteria way deep down that are not exposed to oxygen. And so those are obligate anaerobic bacteria. As we go up, there's some bacteria that that can live in a little bit of oxygen. So we call those facultative anaerobic bacteria. They can take a little bit of oxygen, but they can't be out in the open. And then uh, those are out in the open are called aerobic bacteria or just aerobes. So um, there are different oxygen requirements and we can put bacteria in the groups according to their, to their requirements. <clears throat> Another thing that uh, the bacteria do, uh, some bacteria, not all bacteria, not even most bacteria, but some bacteria are autotrophic. Most bacteria are heterotrophic, which means that they need to get, they need to eat, they need to get their food from somewhere. But autotrophic bacteria make their own food and some are photosynthetic. Um, of all the autotrophic bacteria, most of these are photosynthetic bacteria here. Like here's an example of some bacteria living on some plants, but this, uh, this more uh, blue screen bacteria. Actually, this used to be called the blue-green algae. But when, you, when they were able to develop microscopes, they were able to see the structures. And when they, when they were able to take a look at these from a biochemical point of view, um, they realized that these aren't algae at all. They're, they're bacteria. So blue-green algae is a, an older term for, for this group. These are called the cyanobacteria. So most are photosynthetic, but I mentioned that the bacteria at the bottom of the ocean, these are chemoautotrophic, chemoautotrophic bacteria, and uh, they're able to survive because they can use, um, use chemicals for the source of energy instead of sunlight. All right, um, most bacteria are heterotrophic bacteria. Hetero means different, trope has to do with food. So they heterotrophic bacteria, and we are heterotrophs also. We humans, we uh, are, need to get our food from a different place. So that's what heterotrophic means, or heterotrophs. All right, and so here's some terms, and I'm just gonna quickly um, take a look at this, but. We have photo autotrophic, which means they 
They make their own food using light from the sun. So auto, self, trope, food, photo, light. And these guys can also make their own food, but they use inorganic chemicals like, uh, for example, uh, hydrogen sulfide as an energy source. So that's chemoautotrophic bacteria. There's hetero, no, no, photo heterotrophs. And they can also uh, use the sunlight for their energy source, but they also need to, need to eat. And we are chemo heterotrophic. Uh, we need to eat. Usually we don't have this distinction. The heterotrophs are linked together like this, but sometimes when you need to study things, you uh, make that distinction that a biologist might. All right, another thing though for the rest of us to know is that some few bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria, um, these, uh, these are bacteria that live in the nodules that are found inside the roots of a specific uh, type of plant of legumes. Um, and, and then these guys uh, inside these things like their alfalfa and peanuts and things like that um, will have these nodules in their roots and the bacteria living inside are the bacteria that can take the nitrogen out of the air. Most of the atmosphere is nitrogen. 78% uh, of the atmosphere is nitrogen but we can't do anything with it. We breathe it in and we breathe it out. But nitrogen fixing bacteria are able to take that and then change it into, uh, uh, change the uh, diatomic nitrogen into uh, nitrates or, or nitrites. And then the other bacteria change the nitrites to nitrates and nitrates are, Essential in plants. Um, when you are uh, trying to uh, grow a new lawn or feed the, your current lawn, you might put fertilizer on there. And those fertilizers have, have nitrates in it. And then if we eat plants, then that's how we get our nitrates into our system. Or if you eat, you know, if you eat uh, animal product, then um, what you're doing is you're you're eating the proteins which have, have nitrogen in them. So, you know, everything, uh, is, life is, is, uh, is dependent on, on these bacteria in a way, because uh, these, are, these bacteria are the, the plants that will uh, take up the, the, uh, the nitrogen. Speaking of plants, here's some plants that aren't doing too well. Um, some bacteria are pathogenic to plants. So, um, it's important that we study bacteria when we're taking a look at agriculture because um, we need to know what to do about those. Uh, I remember uh, when I was growing up, I grew up near Salinas, California, which is the lettuce capital of the world. Uh, but uh, a, a few miles north, about 15, 20 miles north, is a little town called Watsonville, which is often called the strawberry capital of the of, of the world. Um, uh, the city of Oxnard would, would probably debate that, but Watsonville has been called that for such a long time. <clears throat> um, in Watsonville, I can remember growing up as a kid that the, it was controversial when they, they took uh, some bacteria and sprayed them over the strawberries um, because there are some bacteria that instead of causing a disease like you see in this photo, there's some bacteria that will, will help uh, the strawberries to, uh, to not be damaged by frost. So when it gets too cold, you know, your strawberries are gonna go bad. But uh, for a while they were spraying these uh, bacteria on them to, to combat the, the frost. So bacteria can be bad, but also good. Um, as in, uh, in human life, uh, we use bacteria for good, but there are bacteria obviously that cause diseases. Like here's some different diseases. Legionnaire's disease is one. Um, in Legionnaire's disease, it causes a, a pneumonia. And I have some numbers here. In 1971, uh, there was a, a Le an American Legion convention in Philadelphia uh, that uh, 
they, they couldn't figure out why all these people were getting sick, 221 people um, in, a, in a hotel complex. And uh, during that, that American Legion meeting, 34 people died and they still couldn't figure it out. Well, what it was is the bacteria were getting spread through the air conditioning um, and uh, that's how people were getting sick. So there's Legionnaire's disease. Um, here are ooh, some sexually transmitted diseases. And some of the uh, photos were too graphic. So uh, you have, uh, especially chlamydia, that's why I have the, uh, a drawing up for it. But here is a, uh, a picture of, uh, of a person with syphilis and you can see the symptoms in as early as four weeks, but it might be two years before you see any symptoms of having syphilis, which is uh, pretty crazy. And over here, chlamydia. Chlamydia is a, a really bad sexually transmitted diseases uh, or disease. And you can see right here that chlamydia causes a buildup of, of scarring that blocks the fallopian tube. And then uh, and that woman doesn't get pregnant anymore because it, this is how it usually works. The eggs are made here, go down the fallopian tube and land on the uterus, but if this is blocked and that egg doesn't get up or get out. So that is, uh, that could cause a problem. And then here is uh, gonorrhea, most common uh, of this sexual transmitted diseases. And it usually um, <clears throat> uh, manifests below the belt. But as you can see, this young lady right here uh, also can have a problem in your eyes. You can also have a problem in your throat. And so it's gonorrhea. So you want to get treated very quickly if you uh, have been exposed to that. All right, so here is uh, the, here's the third one that I, in my list. Of course, it's not an extensive list and bacteria cause all kinds of diseases, but <clears throat> this one is, has to do with cavities. And what happens is the bacteria in your mouth feed on the extra sugar and then that produces acid. <clears throat> and acids um, will, react with your tooth, with your enamel, and you have less tooth. And some interesting facts in the corner over here. Um, <clears throat> uh, cavities became much more common after the 1700s when the sugar trade uh, became, uh, uh, you know, it increased uh, dramatically for different parts of the world where, where sugar was the, uh, the industry that drove everything. Uh, like Cuba it used to be uh, actually a pretty rich island, um, but uh, uh, things happened and the trade uh, for, for Cuban sugar uh, became uh, much less. And so the economy in, in Cuba didn't do so well. But as far as uh, the uh, relation of sugar to, to cavities, uh, in the 1700s, cavities became much more common. Um, in the 50s, we see that uh, there was less, uh, or, you know, since the 1950s, there have been improvements in, in, uh, in hygiene that allows these guys to, um, to not grow in our mouths as rapidly. And so when you take care of those bacteria, like when you, when, uh, you have people with access to fluoride in their, in their toothpaste, then, uh, uh, that, then you see a reduction in tooth loss. Okay, so pretty cool. All righty, um, an important section of this uh, talk has to do with bacterial diversity. And so we're gonna look at the, the group, the, Ar the archaea domain, which are also called the archaea bacteria. And then here's some other strange ones we'll take a quick look at. Um, I think I mentioned before that the bacteria and the archaea are distinguished on the basis of their nucleotide sequences. And we saw that this table, um, and you can see from this table that there are differences between the bacteria and the archaea. You don't have to memorize these or even know most of them. You can just take a quick look over here. You can see that the that bacteria and the archaea have many differences biochemically and uh, and so uh, that explains some of the uh, functions that these bacteria have. 
you take a look at the archaea, uh, here are some bacteria which are called methanogens, and they generate methane. And you may have heard that, that uh, cows generate methane. And so here's some Chick-fil-A cows telling you to eat more chicken. But inside their guts, they have these bacteria, these methanogenic bacteria, uh, the methanogens, and they create the methane. Uh, here is a lake that has a different color to it, doesn't it? And that's because these are uh, on, the, on the top of this lake, the layer of halophilic bacteria. Halo means salt and phyl means lover. And so the, these are salt loving bacteria. And over here, this is a, you know, hot springs and geysers. Uh, these are where the thermophilic bacteria live, the thermophiles. So these are obviously not living inside organisms, but well, this one is right here, but the, some of these guys right here, not living inside of an organism, but this one is after, in, a, in a strange place. RK bacteria generally live in, in unique environments. And, and so uh, they are, as we saw, very structurally different from the other bacteria. Uh, we call those the U bacteria. So they're in a totally different domain. I mentioned cyanobacteria earlier. These are bacteria that can make their own food uh, using sunlight. So these are the most simple photosynthetic organisms. And here's just some pictures of some of them. Um, and, uh, and you can see as you take a look at these uh, that these are have a green color to them because they have they have chlorophyll inside them. Even though they don't have chloroplasts, they have chlorophyll. And so these are photosynthetic organisms in these pictures right here. But surprisingly, some of them are bacteria. And then here's a better picture of the legumes, uh, which uh, have the bacteria that are nitrogen fixing bacteria. And it says extract nitrogen from the air and convert it into biologically available forms. As I said, we breathe in the nitrogen, but we can't, we can't use it. But plants, uh, specifically plants that have these nodules, they have the bacteria in them. Well, then they can uh, change it uh, from nitrites or change and they're taking the nitrogen, form nitrites, and then there are other bacteria that change the nitrites to nitrates. Here are the chemoautotrophic bacteria um, that use hydrogen sulfide, you can see right here. And then they break the hydrogen off of this sulfur and use that energy in the covalent bond. Uh, uh, and they also use the you know, once they, they have the sulfur separate, then that becomes uh, the uh, chemicals that they build off of. It says your unique met metabolism allows them to live in environments that lack organic nutrients. Uh, remember, organic has to do with carbon. So, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna do this? Uh, well, the chemoautotrophic bacteria will make their own food based on, on chemicals like this. There are others that they could use as well. All right, as we close up this talk, I also should mention viruses. And this one slide has a lot of um, information about viruses. So if I, I were copying anything, uh, I, would, uh, I would get this one slide because it tells you a lot about viruses. Viruses are not cellular. So we don't even consider them to be living things because, uh, because they, uh, they don't have cells. Remember the cell is a basic unit of life. And so they're non-cellular. Um, when we say they're infectious, that means it causes a disease. So these are disease causing agents. And then um, it tells you a little bit about the structure. It has a protein coat surrounded by nucleic acid, which is usually DNA, but not always, sometimes it's RNA. Um, there's some, and then what we have found is that there's some, some few bacteria that can change, have an enzyme that can change the RNA to DNA, and we've taken advantage of that in genetic engineering. And also viruses cannot reproduce by themselves. They have to hijack another cell and then put their their genetic information into that cell, and then that cell will make the virus. So that's what happens in our bodies. 
when we get a virus, um, it takes over the cells and then the cells will, as, they, as the cell is making its own proteins, it's its own products, and also makes a, the virus uh, components. And that's, uh, that's how viruses work. Um, some, uh, these are big viruses. These are called bacteriophages. And uh, here's a bacteriophage right here. Um, this one's landing on a E. coli uh, bacterium. Those live in your gut. And so it says that what happens is these viruses invade the host cell, take over the cell, and begin replicating viruses or parts of viruses. And then they make so many of them that the cell explodes, or the term is lysis, or bursts. And so um, when the cell does lyse, um, it gets to about a certain size with a certain number of viruses. So for some viruses, we know of something called a burst size. And so the burst, uh, so the, the, the uh, bacterium will explode after uh, getting to uh, a different size because it's full of viruses. And then those viruses are released into the environment, which might be the bloodstream, and it can affect uh, other, other cells. Now, sometimes the virus message will go to sleep. And we call that the lysogenic stage, or the whole process is called lysogeny. And so you can see in this picture, here's that virus, and it put in its, its DNA, and that DNA becomes incorporated into the bacterial chromosome. At this point, it's called a prophage. But now, whenever this back, and it's not causing a disease yet, uh, for example, but what happens is that this guy then, this bacterium will just reproduce like normal, and then make two, and then four, and then eight, and just keep going. And the, the, uh, the virus DNA is essentially off, right? But then something in the environment turns it on and it comes out of the lysogenic cycle. And then the, uh, the, the message will be read and then the viruses will be made. Well, not just one cell anymore, but it's thousands upon thousands of cells that have uh, the, uh, the message and probably millions because remember you have, uh, you're, you're in, your, in your body, you have what, what is it? 38 uh, billion, no, the billion or trillion. You have a lot of cells in your body, right? Um, and you have even more bacteria in your body than you do your own cells. So um, the virus just needs to get a hold of some bacteria. And then, you know, like I said, it passes just the, that message along and something in the environment says, all right, let's turn it on and it turns on. You can see that in this, uh, in this picture right here because now it goes from the lysogenic cycle to the lytic cycle. And so there is the, there's still the same message and it's being read over and over again. And, um, and then over here, what you see is that, that DNA comes out and there's the environmental trigger right here and the DNA is, is made. So you, now you have multiple copies of this. And, and then the other parts of the viruses are made. And then that puts it all together. And once you get to a certain size, that whole thing blows up. So that's called the lytic cycle. Now viruses are very different from each other, but we classify them according to their structure. So we already saw the, the bacteriophages. Here's the first virus that was uh, discovered. This is TMV, the tobacco mosaic virus. And then here's a picture of the uh, HIV, uh, the human uh, immunodeficiency virus. And you can see that it has a different structure. So it's structure that is used to classify the different viruses. It's also the type of nucleic acid that it uses. So viruses are not bacteria, viruses are not alive, but they're certainly microscopic and warrant a, a good study right here. All right, so that is, uh, that is uh, bacteria and viruses. In a nutshell, there's so much more to know. Um, some people in college 
uh, major in this and study uh, microbiology, bacteriology. Um, so uh, we've just uh, taken a, a look at a little bit of, of the uh, bacteria now. Um, but, uh, but that's it. So um, I'm Mr. Vallejo and this is uh, biology. Thank you for coming class today. Um, we'll see you soon. Thank you.